Um, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our Black History Month kickoff in partnership with BBSA, IFA, and the Fink Center. Um, it's unfortunate we weren't able to do this in person, but as you all know, safety takes precedence and it's still great we could hold this event virtually. Uh, my name is Jamal Powell and I am a full-time MBA student graduating in the class of 2022. And I'm joined here by our guest, Mr. James Bell. Um, Mr. Bell was born in South Central Los Angeles as the youngest of four. He attended California State University at Los Angeles and majored in accounting. He worked through college. Upon graduation, he was offered a job at Rockwell International Corporation, and he worked in various accounting functions there. Uh, soon after, Rockwell was acquired by the Boeing Company, and at Boeing, Mr. Bell really continued his ascent. So in 2000, he became the corporate controller where he developed company processes for how the business should report to the government. In 2003, he was tapped to fill in as CFO. In 2005, he stepped in as interim CEO and president. And in, in 2008, he was named corporate president. Um, a few years later, he decided to retire from Boeing and that was in 2012. Since then, Mr. Bell has been a member of the board of directors for Apple, uh, JP Morgan Chase, Dow Chemical, among others. And we're very excited to have you here today, Mr. Bell. So thank you once again for joining. Hey, hey thank you, Jamal. Thank you for that wonderful in introduction. But I'm actually delighted to be here with you all today. So I'm really uh, interested in, in hearing the questions you have and so I can answer them. I'm not Absolutely. one that just talks about myself much, but I <laughs> can. We can do it. Um, yeah, so just to give a kind of overview of the agenda today, we're going to go over the back, background of Mr. James Bell, we'll go through his leadership style, career, some of the challenges, and then advice. We'll save around 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, Mr. Bell, you grew up in South Central Los Angeles in a working class Black community. Can you talk a little bit about your family and how your upbringing shaped you and enabled your success? Yeah, well, you know, I, I did grow up in, in that neighborhood and it was interesting because my mother and all her, her siblings lived, uh, moved to L.A. from Oklahoma. And so I had a lot of cousins, but we were a very close knit family. And, you know, basically we already had, you know, two basketball teams between the custom, between the cousins. So, you know, we had we did have each of us have friends in our own neighborhood, but it was, a you know, we were very, very uh, focused with a, a grandfather who just sort of dominated the family and like kept us together. So, you know, we grew up in that, that kind of a closed knit environment. And it was, uh, it was interesting because, you know, looking back at it, it, I think it helped to establish, you know, high self-esteem, you know, you had high moral ethics and, you know, because they didn't, my, our parents didn't play. And then the neighborhoods in those days, you know, all the people in the neighborhood helped raise you. So, you know, the whole theory about you're raised by a village was put in play there. And so you kind of you kind of couldn't get away with anything. I mean, you know, because <laughs> they would they would tell your parents. And so uh, at the time, I didn't like it. But looking back at it, I think it helped to mold me and make me a, a better person. So very I think it was an interesting upbringing and uh, I think served me well throughout my uh, career. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, many young black Americans often felt that the best career they could hope for was really simply a secure job. And I know that you had a number of jobs from, from cleaning shoes at a golf course, cleaning buildings, and even working at the post office. What made you decide to go to college and pursue a degree in accounting, a business degree? Well, you know, like you said, I did have a lot of jobs, but my, that, that was more about having financial independence. I always thought, you know, as a young person, I wanted to have my own money. I didn't want to have to rely on what my parents were able to give me. But you're right. At, you know, our, our models were our parents and they, they worked either at the county for the at the county, the post office, but just a secure job. And that's sort of how what you knew. But what really drove me to college is so was when I graduated from high school, you know, where you all you, you were connected and you knew where all the parties and things were going to be. And I'm saying now I'm going to lose that. So I better go to college. So I'll know, you know, get back, be reconnected in some kind of social environment. And, and really and truly, <laughs> believe it or not, that had a lot to do with it. You know, it we're, what were you going to do socially when you came disconnected from an institution that you'd spent, you know, basically all your life to date in? And now what do you do? And so that was sort of a, a major 
driver. But the other thing is why I majored in accounting. I said, well, if I'm going to college, I'd like to major in something that where I thought I'd come out with a tool set that would allow me or enable me to get a job uh, much quicker. And so that's kind of how I, I just sort of fell back in. And I mean, I, at the time, I really couldn't even tell you what a controller was or a CFO. I didn't know any of those things, but I just thought that uh, it would give me the best platform coming out with the tool set that would enable me to get a job. Sure, absolutely. And, you know, you talk about your tool set and how, you know, it seems like leadership was something that really was an integral part of your life um, from being the student body president during your senior year of high school to um, an executive vice president at Boeing. Can you describe your leadership style and how you develop it over the course of your career? Yeah, I would say now it's 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 it was inclusive. I mean, I didn't, when I started, I didn't have a, a thing in mind as to what it was going to be. I think people did gravitate to me early at an early age. And, you know, I try to take into consideration if we were talking about what, what we're going to do, going to a movie, going whatever we're going to do is try to get everybody's input and decide what's the best way to get there and how we're going to do what we want to. But I would say it's inclusive. I, I, I was uh, the kind of person that would like to understand what the, the real issue is or the real job that we had to do and, and get resolved and how to get everybody engaged in doing what they can do to contribute at an optimal level to, to that uh, end. So, you know, I wasn't a micromanager. I was more of, you know, here are the objectives, you know, who can, who's best at what the things we need to get done and let's put it in there and then you're going to be accountable for getting it done. Now, if you need help, come back and let's discuss it. But you know, otherwise, I'm just going to expect you to show up when you're supposed to. And so that's been pretty much my management style. And, and you know, after I started managing 200,000 people, that's about all you can do. Right. So it, it was good that I started on that path. So was that influenced by any books you read or anything like that? Uh, not really. You know, I, listen, the leadership books are good. I, I would recommend you, you read them. But there's nothing like experience. You know, like my first leader, leadership job, I was the supervisor of accounts payable. And, you know, and I was like 23, 24 years old and all the people work with me, that worked for me were my mother's age. So, and there were women and I had like 20 women working for me and they were like 40 or 50 or 60, or whatever, whatever my mother was at the time. And my best advice at managing them was what my mother told me. So, and she didn't write a band, she didn't write a leadership book, but the information I got from her is what and how to treat them and she basically said, treat them like you treat me and then you, you'll get you'll 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 be OK. And that, that it did work. So I think the books are good. But, you know, the, the, the thing that uh, I think helped me was just like having an open minded to the experiences I was I had and then how to adapt to those given, you know, what the set of circumstances were. So, uh, yeah, anyway, I, like, I, I don't want to discourage you for reading leadership books, but I will tell you that all the answers aren't there. A lot of it is just personal experience and what you see in terms of feedback from people that you're trying to lead. Yes, that's, that's an answer I can appreciate. Yeah, thank you. And one other thing, you know, kind of along those lines, when you do think about managing, you know, hundreds of thousands of people and you look at the leaders that you've led and look at leaders today, what is, like, what is one characteristic that you say um, is most critical to being a good leader? Well, I think that the most critical part of is being inclusive and and mm -hmm. recognizing, you know, the best leaders recognize they don't know everything and they recognize where they can go get help and fill the gaps that they themselves can fill. And they have the um, uh, confidence to do that. You know, the key I always said the key to a good leader is hire people smarter than you. And, and a lot of people have a hard time doing that. You know, they can't they have a hard time trying to lead people that they know have more experience or more expertise in an area that they're responsible for. But, you know, that's one of the keys. And so you want to find somebody that has the confidence, you know, not arrogant, but confident in what they do uh, and that, you know, they really can, you know, bring the best out of other people. And, and that's a skill set that I'm not sure you're going to read a lot about in the leadership books. But they're going to tell you to do that. But how to do it is a different story. And that it's, it's based on, you know, what your, your background is a lot, uh, has a lot to do with it. But, you know, how you deal with people in general, you know, and, 
and respecting that, that they can bring something to a table uh, that you yourself couldn't bring and being able to recognize it and not be intimidated by it and where you would try to suppress it. So, you know, what I look in a leader is a person that understands that and understands they don't know everything and understands they can't do everything. But when it comes down uh, that if there's an error make, they accept that it was their responsibility and you know, not let that just flow down unfiltered to the people that might've made the mistake. You have to be able to support your people. Right, absolutely. Um, so you sit on a number of boards, including my former employer, JP Morgan. Um, you're the only black member on Apple's board. So it's clear that across your career, it's been common for you to be the only black executive in the room. How do you navigate these spaces and establish yourself? Well, you know, listen, I'm pretty comfortable being black and always have been. And so I don't go in it just thinking that I just go in it and be it. I just be black. You know, it's not like I got to give a thought about it or think that I have to say things differently. I don't. I'm the same on this call as I am in, in Apple's board meeting or in J.P. Morgan Chase's board meeting. And so I, you know, I think that the, the first thing you got to do is be really comfortable with who you are, you know, and, and part of who I am is black. You know, and, and that's probably I was the first thing I was before I was an accountant, the first before I was a leader or anything else, I was black. And so I'm pretty comfortable with it. And so I act that way. So I don't see it as something that I have to feel like I have to introduce into a, a room. When I walk in, it's there, you know, and, and it's obvious. So um, I don't make it a, an issue for me. You know, it might be an issue for other people, but it's not an issue for me to be black. And, and I'm in the room and I'm going to do and say what I want to do and say. So but I think it, it stems from being comfortable with who you are. Yeah, for sure. And so along those lines, you know, clearly you have a lot of power and influence in those rooms. Could you provide an example for you know our audience of how your presence in that room, like maybe at J.P. Morgan, what kind of um influence your presence has had on some decision making there? Yeah, well, well, remember, I have a very extensive financial background and, and a background in, in governance. And so uh, when they were in the financial crisis, you know, Jamie asked me to be the chair of the audit committee. So quite frankly, that skill set is something that, you know, a company like J.P. Morgan Chase really wanted. And to have it wrapped up in a black person was even a bonus for him. Now, but when 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 you get that skill set, you also have to come in and understand that I have a diversity agenda and I would expect you to make to to make improvement in terms of the company's diverse diversity stature, both from investing in other companies, hiring diverse suppliers and partners and financial services and in hiring and promoting. And then I hammer that in the in the board meeting and I don't take prisoners from the standpoint that we're trying hard. We don't pay for effort. We pay for results. There's not a corporation in the world that just pays for effort. So when the people say they're making a good effort in diversity, but they're not getting there, then they need to change some of the people that are responsible for that program. And so that's what I bring into a board. But you got to have a platform. If they didn't need me for my financial expertise and my and the governance experience that you know allowed me to deal effectively with regulators as we worked our way out of this the financial crisis then maybe they wouldn't have heard me on the diversity side. So remember, you got to bring something to the table. And I think diversity is just as important as those other things. But, you know, I, corporations are going to be looking at fundamentally what they think they need. And all of them aren't enlightened as to the, the, the benefits of diversity at this point. But they are they do know that they got to meet regulatory guidance. They have to have financial performance. They have to understand you know, how to get there and manage costs, how to how to deal with uh, people that are involved in services that you can't, you know, double check everything they do. But you have to make sure they have the right attitude that, that, that they'll go out and try to present this company in the way you want want them to. And that's a skill set I bring to a board. And as you you know, think back over your career starting in your you know 20s and 30s um, and since then, what are some of the challenges that you think you face, whether it's, you know, as a black man in corporate America or kind of more broadly, like some of the biggest challenges that you've overcome in your career? 
Well, you know, I think racism was a big one, you know, and, and the, you know, because I think that, you know, as I grew up in this company, uh, Rockwell and then on into Boeing, you know, I think it was always a challenge uh, for white people to assume or to believe I was good as I was. And so, and because they hadn't seen it before, and particularly if you're the only one and you're the first. And so they weren't that comfortable with seeing that kind of uh, contribution and expertise uh, wrapped in a black package. And so I think I always encountered, now the, 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 the thing that how I dealt with that, I made that their problem, not mine. So I just figured out what I needed to do to be successful. And I, and I would encourage all of you all to stay focused on that because racism is not going anywhere. I mean, it, it will continue to evolve. It'll be uh, more sophisticated than it was when I was coming up because it is now, but it's not going anywhere. So you can't let it be an obstacle for you. I would, I would figure out what, it, what I needed to do to check the boxes that they said needed to be checked. And it, it was more difficult for me because sometimes I wasn't initially provided the opportunities to do the things I needed to do to check that box, but you keep going, you, you just have to stay at it. But so that, that was, that was probably the major issue because the rest, you know, it didn't seem that hard. I know when you talk to executives, you think they're smart. Well, they're not any smarter than you are. We just have access to, to smart people and more information on a topic. So when we talk about something, we sound like, you know, we, we, we really got it going on. We know a lot. Well, we do, but we got it from somebody else. Believe me. It's not like any of us who just, just figured it or sitting at our desk, figured out how to solve all the world's problems. We got the world's experts to help us, believe me. So that that is not as hard as it seems. I think there, there are certain things you have to learn as you go through the uh, journey that and, and, and be able how to be able to put that in practice, you know, depending on what the circumstances are. But you know, most, uh, most smart people can do that if given the opportunity. So, uh, but so I think that would probably be the biggest obstacle and, and you know, obviously I overcome it. Yeah, absolutely not. Thank you for that, that example. Um, we constantly hear how important it is to have mentors, how they can truly influence a person's career. And I, you know, I know for a fact, I, I wouldn't be sitting here today if it weren't for some mentors in my life. Did you have any mentors who you really looked up to and really helped you specifically? I had a number of them, and it, it started from day one uh, when I came into the company uh, because I was an accountant. As I said, I, I I majored in accounting, thinking I'd have tools that would I could directly apply once I graduated and went to work. Well, come to find out, accounting in college is bookkeeping. It's really not any kind of skill set you're going to learn. Be able to get have tools that you can just get a job in immediately, because particularly now, because. Even in those days, at least we made manual journals. Now all that's automated and you never, you never do that. And that's basically what you learned at the time I was going to college. But so I have guys that would, uh, that for, I don't know, for whatever reason, uh, thought that I was worth spending time with and they would help me get through that, help me get through those initial years uh, and working because, you know, I, I, I really wasn't a skilled accountant. I just had a, an accounting degree. And there's a big difference, you know, and so um, they that that started early on. And then as I progressed in the organization, you know, other people signed on and, and helped me uh, like like basically, you know, deal with how to get through the certain areas I needed to have in my my toolkit in order to be considered for, for, for promotions, not only informing me of, you know, because they're at they're at that level, they're making the decisions on who to promote and they're looking for certain things in those people uh, in the experience bucket, you know, if you don't know what those are that you don't, and, and you don't have an opportunity to get into those organizations to get them, then you're, it's, it's pretty tough. And so I've had people along the way that, that helped me do that a lot. And, and it was important. Right. Absolutely. And I might mention they were all white because obviously there was nobody black or of color at all. In fact, I think there was one woman who was on our legal st legal team uh, that just because she was in, in the legal organization, she, she gathered a lot of information and she would share things with me that were, I think that were helpful in me making career decisions. Absolutely. And, you know, you, you touched on this some as far as leadership and being inclusive as business professionals in this Zoom room today. What advice would you give to students here um, outside of the kind of leadership inclusivity aspect? 
Well, I think, uh, you know, you need to be sure that you have different voices in a room. Like I used to tell my team, if all of you are going to say what I'm going to say, then I can just cut your, cut my staff. You know, I don't need you. I mean, basically, I can just up my pay and then let you go because you're going to say the same things I'm saying. And, and what diversity brings to the table are different things and are different views of things. So it doesn't necessarily change the set of facts you're dealing with, but it surely does help you view those on a broader scale, more universally as to, you know, what's the right thing to do given your set of circumstances. So I think in a broad sense, that's, that's really important. Now people are different, even in the same color set, right? But what's really obvious if, if you're different uh, colors, if you're a male versus a female, where in those days, everybody was white male, essentially, uh, then there's going to be a different perspective that comes to play, put on the table. Now, there has to be an environment that is created that allows you to feel like it's going to be valued. Otherwise, you're not going to do it. I mean, you're not going to sit in a room of all people that are of the same and you're different. And, and every time you offer some advice, they tell you, well, you know, thank you, but no thank you. You know, so the two need to go hand in hand. Now, when I was coming up, it didn't necessarily go hand in hand. I think we're doing a better job of that today, but I was, you know, I, I was actually fearless. I, I really didn't think, I, I mean, I didn't really think I needed to work. I mean, I, I didn't really care necessarily about a job, but if I was going to be on a job, I was going to do, get the most out of it and put my best foot forward. But I wasn't, you know, I wasn't overly concerned about being fired for speaking my mind. And I could have been, I mean, <laughs> maybe, and maybe I should have been, I don't know, but, yeah, yeah. but, but it, it worked out okay. But you know, I, I, I just feel like you have to make sure uh, when you're in an environment and you're trying to get something done, you've got to get different uh, kinds of opinions and, and opinions that come that are, are formed by different backgrounds and different experiences. <clears throat> Even though it seems like a mundane problem, getting to a, the best solution is when you really are challenged, you know, by the thought process of going through finding solutions. And that only happens when you have diversity and inclusion. Uh, absolutely. Um, is there any one particular thing that you can think of in your career that you may have done differently? Well, <laughs> I, you know, it's I, I've done so many things in my career that, you know, not, not all of them are, are home runs. Not all of them were the right things to do. Uh -huh. But I don't know that you could take one out and just say, I wouldn't do it because if I knew it wasn't the right thing to do before I did it, I wouldn't have done it, but I didn't know that. So everything I did, you know, added to my learning and, and had me how, how I thought about things. And, and uh, the one thing I can tell you though, it, it taught me along the way that you really need to listen to everybody now. And a lot of people say, well, you know, do you need to listen to somebody that you absolutely know, doesn't know as much as you do. And I always say, well, how would you absolutely know that? So when I say you have to listen to everybody, it's, it doesn't cost you anything to listen. I mean, you don't have to utilize it at all, but you know, if you listen, at least that checks a box that, well, okay, that party, party didn't have anything to offer. So I, I think early on in my career, I probably tried to do too much myself. And then as I got into organizations where I had more people and more things to do that I could, and I, that I definitely could do myself, you'd start having to figure out how to rely on people and getting the best results out of them. So maybe I could have done that earlier on. I don't know, but I finally got to that point. Right. Get your learnings. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one question around work-life balance. You know, some people argue that the concept of work-life balance isn't really real, you know, but we're constantly managing trade-offs. You're a father, you're a husband, how has that impacted your experience and how have you been able to manage success in both areas of the life of your life? Over the yeah, I have. Listen, I, you know, when you start working, I mean, you need to do you need to give it 110 percent. But when I left the office, I stopped thinking about work. That was it. And people would ask me what kept me up at night. Nothing kept me up at night unless it was a party, but nothing. I mean, I wasn't worried if I thought I could do something that would affect something that we were working on, then I'd stay in the office and do it. But when I, when I, once I left, I went home, you know, and that was it. Now, 
it does, the higher up you go in an organization, I I don't think you should kid yourself. You know, you're on 24 seven. If you're a CFO of a major corporation or the CEO, you're you're 24 seven. But given that you still should carve time out to be with your family and do other things. But at that, at that stage, you pretty much like what you're doing. I mean, or you wouldn't be doing, or you really wouldn't be successful on it. So it doesn't seem like work to you. Uh, you have to be mindful that everybody in your organization isn't in that same place and, 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 and obviously give them the space so they can make the separation. But I, I think, you know, it's, there's a lot of discussion around that, like, you know, whether or not you should just work eight to five. Well, I don't know. I think you need to get comfortable in what you're doing and then how that affects the rest of your life, because it is a significant impact on your life and you need to find joy in it. You need to have fun with it. And however you do that, whether you, you leave work early and do it with your family or you engage in activities that allow you to do both. But uh, it, it's not as simple as, you know, I, I'm going to work eight to five, four days a week or, you know, five days a week or whatever the case may be. I just don't think it's that simple. Absolutely. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, I know that we have a few questions in the audience. So I did want to open it up to, for, for Q&A in our audience. Sure. Uh, the way we'll do that, we'll just have you all raise, use the raise hand feature, and then I'll just select you uh, based on who's risen their hand first. Okay, uh, Mariana, feel free to go ahead and ask your question. I'll make sure you're unmuted. So. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here with us and sharing a lot of your knowledge as an experienced executive. I think we are all really enjoying your conversation right now, um, especially the party comment. Uh, (laughs) But question for you um, in your experience, in your career, what has been one accomplishment that you are most proud of during your time at Boeing? And if you could share that with us. Well, I think that the the thing that would be the biggest one for me was being appointed uh, first, the CFO of a major corporation, you know, in, in the in the top, you know, we were the top 30 at that point. And um, so that was something I wasn't thinking that coming up in South Central LA that I'd ever be. And then the second was being asked by the board to be the interim C, C, uh, CEO of the corporation, which was now the largest aerospace company in the world being run by a black person, you know, making weapons of destruction. So it was like, now you, you better surely call me Mr. You know, so it's just like, a, it, it, it just, I mean, those are just like leading thoughts to yourself. I mean, I don't think I've ever verbalized it before, but you know, it, it was, it, it, in retrospect, it probably was a big deal. And then I'd go on and say, I was, you know, recruited for the Apple board, which was an interesting process. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your question, Mariana. Um, next, we'll go to Ashley. Feel free to ask your question, Ashley. Thank you, Jamal, and thank you, James, for being here today. As you can tell, our theme is about being Black, and so my question is, what advice do you have for the next generation of leaders interested in making a difference and showcasing diversity in their respectful companies? Well, you know, I, I think prepare yourself, obviously. Um, you know, get comfortable with who you are because there are going to be obstacles and it's not important what they are. What is important is how you deal with them once you confront them uh, and that you always understand how to get out of anything that's going to benefit you. Like one of the things I was going to bring in if had I um, had, had we been in person was my personal performance review when I started in Rock over the first year. And listen, it was need improvement down over 20 pages, you know, at one point, About 10 pages in, I said, I get it. You know, obviously we don't have to go through the other 10. But the thing is, is I could have taken that as a negative or I could have said, okay, what is it that they're saying in these various areas I need to improve in and go focus on that? Because it was clear I needed improvement. I mean, after 20 pages of it, I mean, I think the fact had been made. But the point is, is that I think you have to then take that circumstance and say, well, how do I turn it into a benefit for me. And so that you can continue on uh, doing whatever it is you wanna do in your career. And that's, you have to be able to take criticism. And now all criticism doesn't come to you in a constructive manner, I'll be the first to say that. But okay, 
you know, still don't, you, you still want to see if there's anything in it. Now, everything in that review that I, I first got wasn't true. And I could have made a big issue out of that, but that was the point of it. They would have just rewrote it and said, okay, you're better than this in this area, but they wouldn't have felt that. And, and believe me, <laughs> remember one thing, you don't promote yourself. You know, you have to perform to a level that other people perceive that you're ready to take on the next level of work. And so you never get the opportunity. Or I didn't, in other words, I didn't get the opportunity to appoint myself CFO. Had I had that opportunity, I'd have done it years earlier. And it probably would have been a mistake. But the point is, is that you have to realize that there is a system, there is a process that you work with it. And you always got to figure out as you go through these experiences, what's the things that you can draw from them that would help you the most. And all of them aren't pleasant. All the experiences you go through aren't pleasant. That's the key. And you got to you have to try to convert that to something that's beneficial to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, next, go ahead, Ben. Hey, Mr. Bell, thank you for being with us today. Um, it's just great to just hear your words um, and it's just even uh, resonating with you because actually what, I worked as an engineer at Boeing for some time. So it's just so great to see. Oh, so you know how I was. Oh, I know I was. <laughs> so I really appreciate you, <laughs> you know, just setting the trend for us, you know, really just uh, blazing that trail. I really appreciate it. And for being with us today, share your words of wisdom. Um, the question I had um, is uh, like uh, when you mentioned kind of growing up and, you know, the adversities you have to face and even coming up in black as a black man in corporate America. I guess my question is, how do you all like motivate like those, especially, you know, who, who look like us to go the extra mile when it's, you know, tough, you know, as you know, the things have kind of, you know, racism, you said, has kind of shifted but still there and you know we, i often see friends who kind of just distraught when certain things happen how do you motivate you know like, folks to go that extra mile keep bringing themselves yeah well if it, it, that it's not easy but I, I just think you have to keep working at it and you know and, and the point is if you succumb to racism they won they win i mean that's that's the main thing you just got to realize that you can't let them define you and what you can do and you know, that's what happened in the early years because there was no other option. I mean, so that's, you kind of got trapped in it, but now there are, and there are people that, you know, want to try to make things change, to affect change and make things equal for everybody. So remember that. So you just got to keep focused on doing what the things you need to do. You also need to recognize when you're not doing well. I mean, you know, every, believe it or not, every black person shouldn't be promoted. So my point is, is you got to think about the things you need to do to prepare yourself and, and do those things to the best of your ability. And you have to accept the reality. You know, I had a person once that came in and, you know, I was interviewing and, and uh, I was doing a, a, a follow up performance appraisal on them. And they were about, I don't know, 40 years old and I was like 30. But uh, and, and one of the things they said they want to do would be president of the company. And I was saying, like, that's not realistic. And they said, I'm shattering their dreams. I said, no, you shattered your own dream. If you came in here and said at 40 and you're working as a clerk for me in accounting and you want to be president of the company, I said, it's, it, it's not a realistic goal to set for yourself. You know, because I'm going to be president before you and then you, then you time out. And then, the, then I think they started getting it. But, you know, most people aren't going to have that kind of candid conversation with people. But the point is, is that you have to be realistic as to where you are what you need to do to get to where you want to go. And there has to be both the time and the opportunities available for you to get to do that. But don't give up. Don't shoot yourself. I used to tell people all the time, you know, don't, <laughs> there's no point in killing yourself before you die. You know, so what's the true. point, you know, so keep, keep at it and keep your spirits high. And if you don't like the job you have, go to another job. Don't give up on yourself. I hear that. Thank you much. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Ben. Uh, go ahead, Siash. Hey, Mr. Bell, uh, you had mentioned that you aren't really shy about speaking up and not really worried about the consequences. I was wondering if you had any advice on how to speak up in a more tactful way, especially if you're like the most junior member in a meeting. Yeah, and that's what I meant. You, you do have to be tactful. You got to remember you're in an organization um, that, that, you know, has certain uh, structure, certain formalities about it. You, you just can't go in and say things any way you want to say them. You have to say it in a manner that's constructive and that's, that is 
uh, consistent with whatever the demeanor of the business is or the, the, the thing you're involved in. But what I, what I meant is I wasn't afraid to speak up and say uh, things that I thought were appropriate to be said, given whatever we were talking about. But I was shy. I had to overcome that. You know, I, I very much so. And then that's worse when you're in a, an environment where you're the only one of you and everyone else looks the same and you sort of think they share a same culture, which is not necessarily true, but you know, that's kind of how you see it. If you're the only person of color and everybody else is white, you say, oh, wow, they're all the same. Well, they're not, but that's, that's your, your mindset. But no, what I'm saying is if you have something to offer and something to contribute, you have to force yourself to speak up and, and say it. And I just think that, you know, but it has to be something me, you know, don't, it's not like, you know, you say anything and it's not in the context of the discussion or in the solution that you're trying to arrive at, but you do need to speak up. And it is more difficult when, when you're not in a group that you're as comfortable with or when you would normally be in. Thank you. Thank you, Go, um, Kevin, you're up next. Perfect. Mr. Bell, thank you so much for taking the time out with us today. This has been super uh, helpful and insightful. Um, you talked about, you know, speaking up and not having a problem doing that. Um, how do you go about making decisions, tough decisions, when necessarily the data isn't clear? So I'm trying to figure out, like, what type of internal checks and balances that you have in order to, like, get you to say what you need to say and, like, just make the decision um, that can, you know, potentially Great question. Be so I don't know that the data, I would, I probably wouldn't characterize the data not being clear. The data is not going to com be complete. You're not going to have a complete picture of, of the things that you need to consider in making a decision. And so I think normally, because decisions are um, generally also time constrained. You know, if you had all the time in the world, then you, you probably make 100% perfect decisions. But you don't in reality. And so you have to take all the information. Your job is to be able to, and what you have to learn how to do is to put relatively important weights on the input you get. And, and even though a more weighted input is less defined or less complete, you still have to figure out, is it more so than a, a piece of information that's not nearly as relevant, but it's clear what what that information is and you just you learn it over time uh and so but again you know you if you're if you've been in an environment a long time and you've seen a lot of things you have intuition that will help you to you know fill the gaps but uh i i just never had a lot of problems in making decisions i mean i would get to a point and it was always it always have to be where i felt like it met my fundamental uh, moral standard. And that is, you know, it was honest. It was, you know, it was correct. It was to the best of our ability, um, you know, and it was right, you know, because be honest with you, everything I know about right and wrong, I learned in kindergarten. And I never varied from that my whole life and my whole career. Now I did things that I knew was wrong, but I, <laughs> it, was, it was still based on the right and wrong theory in, in uh, kindergarten. And I think that's you have to get to that. And you got to have that kind of strength uh, in order to make tough decisions. And, you know, you have to do what's right fundamentally. And I think most people know what that is when they get to that point. And then you, you know that there are always going to be some things you didn't have complete knowledge on. But with the knowledge you have, you do the best you can. And I do firmly believe gray area is only created when you don't like the answer. So you go back and create things that says, well, I can rationalize doing this because it's, it's great. Well, I don't know that. I don't, I don't really believe there's a whole lot of gray areas. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Thanks, Kevin. Andrea, feel free to ask your question. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Bell, so much for being here. Um, my question is in regards to checking the boxes. You mentioned that as you progress through your career, um, you made sure to check the boxes. I'm wondering, um, as you progress through your career, how did you see other individuals, especially individuals that were minorities, not checking the boxes? Or how do you, st how do you still see that people are not uh, checking the boxes to make sure that as we uh, go out to the world and have this offers to make sure that we always 
know what we need to do or at least um, make a difference. Yeah, what, what I found over uh, my career, Andrea, was that the people of color didn't know there were boxes. So we didn't know that these were things you needed to do uh, in order to be considered to be promoted within the organization you're in. And it appeared that the people, uh, the, the white people did know and were at some point were counseled on, you know, the priority and the uh, right uh, order. You should try to get these and some might have been group. And you, it's just like college. You got to take certain classes your first year, then you get electives and you can decide how to do them. But you knew what it was. So the first thing was being clear uh, to everybody, making it transparent of what it was that we were looking for. Uh, in order for people to move uh, upward in an organization. For instance, I grew up in a county initially in my organization, and, and there were two things that were critical for me that I had to do before you know, I would be considered to be a director or you know, a higher level person in the organization. And one was having you know, planning, financial planning experience, which if I wouldn't have known that, I mean, planning is, is consistent with accounting, but it's projected forward. So it's a little different. And then having interface with customers. Well, you never will talk to a customer in accounting. I mean, you know, other than calling them and ask them, are you paying us on time? You know, and that's probably not the best <laughs> interface for a customer. But if you don't know that, then you can't, like when you look at opportunities, you can't take that in consideration when you decide what the next job you have uh, that you would, you would have, because otherwise, some jobs that wouldn't look as attractive to you now become very attractive because it checks three or four boxes that the people that you work for are looking for uh, people to have experience in. But the main thing that we had to do was make it transparent that this really, these are really the skill sets and these are the experiences we want to see in people that we're considering for higher level jobs. And so I think that's today knock on wood, that I think that's happening a lot more and a lot more consistent around corporations. And that's the focus. Then the next thing is, is the performance discussion and the development discussion, which is always difficult for white people to have with people of color and particularly uh, brown and black men. They, they are really, really, they really get intimidated by it. And so the thing that I, my advice to, to our community is, is not make it hard for people to help you develop. You know, don't take offense, don't get physical, don't, you know, because don't, don't look at, if you can't, don't look intimidating. <laughs> I don't know how you do that, but, you know, and what that really is and how that converts to individuals. But, you know, that's your job is to try to figure out how to get as much out of that discussion that helps you. It goes back to what I said earlier. You got to be looking at all of these things as getting the data and the information that will accelerate your development. Got it. Thank you for sharing. Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Bell, uh, for joining us today. Uh, given that you led Boeing uh, as interim president and CEO, can you talk about what it's like to assume that type of leadership unexpectedly and then what it's like to lead through a time of uncertainty? Yeah, so two things. Uh, you have to be prepared because you never know what's going to happen. You know, so you need to prepare yourself for a wide range of things that could come your way. Now, and you might say, well, how do you do that? Well, I, you know, basically it's the leadership part you're developing over time, a style, and that it approves very effective because you see people getting things done and really want to work for you and really want to do things for you. There's the technical expertise. I you know, to tell everybody in finance, if they didn't understand our product line, our customer set, and you know what it took to deliver those products and satisfy not only our customers, but the, the, the other constituents that had a regulatory responsibility over what we did, then you really couldn't be a good finance person. I mean, you need to, you know, now, so how do you do that? Well, you get into it and you learn, you figure out what our product lines are and you're, you're probably supporting people in both of them or all of them uh, and you, you be inquisitive. So when it came, when this came up, I mean, I knew our commercial airplane business. I grew up in the government business, knew it well. I knew our customers. I knew the regulatory agencies that, uh, you know, because I did work in all these, these areas and we had to deal with the State Department. We had to deal with Congress, the Pentagon. I mean, I had all those experiences already. So it wasn't like a shock to my system, 
But the most important thing, they fired one guy. And we got 200,000 people that, that, that were the best, as they, at the best in the world at what they do. And so all I did is not get in their way and say, just keep doing that and we'll be fine. And that's the thing that I think you, you have to come to grips with, because I know these jobs look like they're just, you know, out of your reach. But remember, we're getting up, putting on our pants one, one leg at a time, too. And we actually the only reason we know more than you, because we're we've done more and got more experience and you'll get it. So um, it really wasn't a, as <laughs> when when people ask me this, I, you know, I, I, I know I should have an answer, another answer, but it really wasn't that big a deal, to be honest, with you, from what I was already doing. Thank you. Oops. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bell, for the time and uh, all the nuggets you've been sharing with us. Um, obviously, you've been stress and emphasizing and stressing experience throughout our career, but you've also done a lot of work in education. So uh, I'd like to hear more of the work you've done in education and, and how important it is to our community. Well, definitely. Listen, I, I, I've i always said education will set you free. I grew up in South Central L.A. and the people that got educated, they got released for good behavior. Those that didn't are still there. So education is extremely important. Uh, and you're going to find and I found uh, the education in that community isn't on par with education in more affluent communities. When I went to college, I found out I, I was in all the academically rich classes and all of that. And I was, you know, got straight A's and I had to take remedial classes when I went to college so that I'd be at college level. Now I could have been pissed off at that and said, you know, God, well, that's racist. They, they're not teaching us the same way in the, the neighborhood. But the thing is, is that, you know, we have to assume responsibility for our own success and education is something they can never take from you. And so I always, I like to call it the key to freedom because the more, the better educated you are and the more things you know, and you can, I'm still educating myself. I mean, you don't stop trying to learn and stop trying to improve, um, you know, but you know, you, you, you got to think about it in that sense. And so, you know, I was in a, involved in a lot of programs that would try to help uh, young people of color uh, get educated. And, you know, and I understood what they were up against because I came out of one of those communities. And it's tough. It's a lot of peer pressure. Uh, it's even worse now with social media. I mean, it's it just it just beats you into submission. But, you know, you still got to focus on that. That is the one way out. You could sing. You know, you could play sports, uh, but, you know, the thing that everybody can do is get educated. You have to have, you know, some some uh, skill set, innate skill set to do the other two. And then even in, in sports, you know, there's only so many professional teams and have so many players and they got thousands of people coming out every year that's competing for those jobs. Well, there's a hell of a lot more great jobs that pay well in the Fortune 500 than it is in the NBA, the NFL, and all these other uh, professional sports combined. So I think education is really the one way that you can get on the highway to success. Thank you. Thanks, Oogs. Uh, Ransom, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Bell, thank you so much for being here with us today. I really appreciate your time. <clears throat> I'm just curious to know, uh, what does like an inclusive workplace look like to you? And what were some instances in your career where you kind of experienced an inclusive workplace? Yeah. So, so there's two things. Inclusive is, you know, is a broader term about uh, is everybody's input value. I like to call diversity and inclusion because then it's also, you got people of color and women in that environment. So I haven't seen one that I thought would be one that I would call a great example uh, at that stage, because you, when you, what, what the way I would define it is when you walk in and you see a workforce or people sitting out uh, in an office that has everybody represented it, and it wouldn't be a surprise when you saw it. Then that, to me, is a, a diverse, inclusive workforce. You know, when you got walk in and you say, "Oh, that's what I would have expected." And there were so many times when people walked in my office. 
And you could see the shock on their face that there was a person of color sitting in that office. You know, it's just, <laughs> it was like sort of ridiculous, but that's what we have to work for is where everybody, because just, you know, if you just look at what the population trends are, there's going to be far more people of color in this world than there are going to be uh, people that aren't of color. And so that's, that's, that is the future. And so we have to figure out how to get the best talent out of all, out of everybody and in, in, in all groups. But I would say to you, the, the best I'd ever seen at one point was Xerox, but this way back in the uh, 80s and 90s, they, they were really doing a pretty good job of that, of getting a very diverse, inclusive workforce in place. In fact, I interviewed with them. I almost went there one time, but uh, it just didn't work out for me. But yeah, it's, it's tough to, to tell you where you can walk into an office and see it. Now, I got to tell you, when I was on J.P. Morgan's board after a year, you know, I told the board I hadn't seen a black person you know, in a year. And so, you know, basically that meant that no one of color really was high enough in the organization to brief the board. And to me, that was a real problem for a company that old and, and with that many people. And uh, when I said everybody went dead silent, I don't know if they could hear me or understand. I, I would speak in English, but I'm not sure what, what they heard. But, you know, I said, until the next board meeting, I'd like to see somebody of color other than myself, you know, but, and, and so they had somebody come in and brief us. And um, you may have heard of her, her name is Tassanda Duckett, who now runs, who's the CEO and president and chairman of uh, TIA Craft. And at that point, she was doing lease, doing loans for Subarus. And I said, Subarus, who in the hell buys a Subaru? And come to find out, we made a ton of money financing Subarus. I didn't get one, by the way. I, I passed on the opportunity. But anyway, but, you know, that's but that's how it, it's got to get to that point at some point. And I don't know how long it's going to take. And I think companies are in the last couple of years have made a lot of commitments towards that, not only uh improving it in the workplace, but also in their business practices and making sure that they serve the black communities and communities of color better. And we'll see, but I think that's a window that will close quickly if we, we don't figure out how to capitalize on it. Great, thank you. Yeah, so thank you everyone for your questions. These are some really great questions and I'm glad we got them answered. Um, Mr. Mr. James, well, there's one question that they didn't ask. Who do you have okay. in the Super Bowl? The Rams or the, the Bengals? The Rams. The Rams, okay. All right, figure. Yeah. There, there you have it. There it All is. Right. I mean, you know, and and, uh, and I'm not a football fan, but I'd like to see the Rams win for the reasons that they're L.A. Rams and yeah. they're playing in their stadium. So let's see. There and my are. wife is from Ohio, so obviously that's – and she is a football fan, so we'll see how that goes. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. It's, it's really been a pleasure to have you on here and speak with you um, and engage with us as uh, all the students here. Um, I also want to say thank you to BBSA, IFA and the Fink Center, especially uh, Rebecca Fuang, Oog Zaswala and Chris Lowe for the hard work and adaptability to make this event happen. Um, in addition, there's a full schedule of events this month for Black History. So be sure to check those out and stay tuned and we'll, we'll keep in touch. Thank you again, Mr. Bell. Hey, thank you, Jamal. It's been a pleasure. You all take care and, and go out and do great things because I'm tired. It's time for you all to take over. <laughs> take care. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.